50 cents of your premium dollar on health care or improvements to health care or provide you a refund. This means that 119,448 South Carolina residents with private insurance coverage will benefit from 6,169,507 in refunds from insurance companies this year for an average refund of 70 per family covered by a policy within South Carolina. The law bans insurance companies from imposing lifetime dollar limits on health benefits, freeing cancer patient, patients and individuals suffering from other chronic diseases from having to worry about going on without treatments because of their lifetime limits. Already, 1,458,000 people in South Carolina, including 566,000 women and 397,000 children, are free from worrying about lifetime limits on coverage. The health care law increases the funding available to community health centers nationwide. In South Carolina, 21 health centers operate 176 sites providing preventive, preventative and primary health care services to 326,829 people. Health, care, health center grantees in South Carolina have received 64,346,762 under the health care law to support ongoing health center operations and to establish new health care sites, expand services, and or support major capital improvement projects. In South Carolina, people with Medicare save nearly $100 million on prescription drugs because of the Affordable Care Act. In 2012 alone, 52,686 individuals in South Carolina saved over $36 million, or an average of $677 per beneficiary. In 2012, people with Medicare in the donut hole received a 50% discount on coverage brand name drugs and a 14% discount on generic drugs. I believe that from the facts that I presented here tonight, that there is more than sufficient evidence that South Carolina should not exempt itself from implementing the Affordable Care Act. When reviewing facts and numbers and not opinions, the residents of South Carolina stand to gain far more than they stand to lose from the law's implementation. It is for these reasons that I'm asking you all to allow the law to go into effect in South Carolina. If we are to be working towards making every South Carolinian's life longer and healthier, then I believe that this new law will assist us in achieving that ultimate goal. Thank you for letting me speak here tonight, and I hope you take ser in serious consideration of the benefits of all South Carolinians. Healthcare 
is paid for by the country and to penalize our employers by asking them, when I was doing this back in the 80s, when I was working with Dr. Deming who taught Japan and he had one of the seven deadly diseases that he felt was destroying American business, was not having health care that competed with other countries. It was $700 for an automobile company for every single car that went off in their health care cost. So they were competing with that. I would love it if you would look at it from the perspective of not paying the fine of a company that doesn't provide health care, but instead put in a law that helps pay the employer to pay for health care so that they can give it to their employees so that they can have healthy, productive employees. Thank you very much. Like our 
our sky high unemployment and our underfunded and underperforming schools. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 So let me just let me just conclude by saying this to my Tea Party friends. You lost. Get over it. If you want to go out and get rid of Obamacare, go out and win some elections. That's how we do it in America. And while you're at it, read the Constitution, take a civics course, and for God's sakes, turn off Glenn Beck. Thank you. Uh -huh. <laughs> Medicaid, 
for the three-year period and get together a committee or a group to say, okay, we want to see, a, if we don't like <coughs> what some of the provisions are, we have enough talent, in my opinion, in this state, I really believe that, We're, we have talent in this state, then let's use that period, let's request a waiver, let's put together something where we can request a waiver to do it the way we think it should be done. Let's also be mindful, and, and again, I'm, I'm mindful of deficits. As I said, I work for the government, and I, I, I'm a taxpayer, all those good things, and I believe that we can work together to keep prices, and, and we do have to address deficits, I, I definitely agree, but we don't have to sacrifice people to do that, in my opinion. that commission or that group, I think it was recommended in the proposed legislation. Let's get people of reason to work together. Let's demonstrate that South Carolina is not like the federal, like Congress. That we don't take actions that we know will fail and will cost us money. But we're going to devote our energies to, fall, to, to finding solutions. That's what we're going to devote the energy to. And we're going to devote those resources that we might pay in legal fees to paying for some of the things that otherwise might not be paid for. I'm a simple person. And I do believe that if we start and think about all of us, and all of us have ideas and thoughts and they're different opinions, but that's what makes us great. I, I see that what it makes us great. We do have to think about the fiscal. We've got to think about the human. We've got to think about the fiscal. But we have enough talent balance that. So I implore you, do not support 3101, but do take action to meet the needs of our uninsured citizens and demonstrate that you as elected leaders, you demonstrate how we should act as a community. You differ, but we find what is the common denominator and we work towards the common denominator. That's all I'm asking you to do. Work toward that. Because that's the approach I take, not because I'm right. It's helped me many times. So I thank you for the opportunity. I, I apologize. I did not intend to get up, but I, I, I'm sitting here, and I see that we're going to have unnecessary division in our state unless leadership is exerted and that we learn from the federal government in state mistakes. Let's not do that. We're better than that. I'm a South Carolinian, too. Born on Paris South, proud of Daddy served him in the military, Marine Corps. Hoorah. The hoorah. <laughs> and I'm proud of this state, and I want to be proud of us going forward. And I'm asking you to demonstrate your leadership by bringing us together and resolving the issue of the uninsured in South Carolina. Thank you.
and not have to be a burden to other states. Recently, the state rejected funds for education, and now we are rejecting funds for health care. I favor the exchanges. I think that the exchanges are a good idea, and I'm sad that South Carolina is not participating in that, because as I read my Facebook postings and the newspaper and talk with friends, I realize that they're getting a better deal on their health care than we're getting here in South Carolina, and that bothers me. As you know, we can shape federal funds, and you probably know that our poor state receives more funds than it contributes, almost twice as much that we get back here in South Carolina. And so I, I'm grateful for the support we receive in our poor state, and I want to receive it. That's why I pay my taxes. Sirs, with all due respect, your time and our money will be better spent on job creation, on ethics reform, on better voting machines, on tax reform, as well as addressing the health care needs of our community, and also finding ways to support a more than minimally adequate public education for South Carolina students. I agree with you. Um, I agree with the words today in the Post and Courier ed, um, editorial, and that's unusual for them to, I think, come out um, with this kind of um, editorial. But their, their closing words were, trying to nullify Obamacare is an absurd waste of our, our lawmakers' time. And I know it's an absurd loss of our money. So um, I hope that you will um, really consider it of this law to focus your attention on the items I mentioned, ethics reform, education, tax reform, finding better ways to um, meet the needs of these 300,000 people. That's a lot of people in South Carolina who need help, and I'll leave you with this article. Thank you. She followed me out of the store. She said, 
I only make six hundred dollars a month. I wish somebody give us the money where we can have the ability to afford health care. So when I sit here and I listen to a couple of things that were said about prepaid insurance, I have to wonder how in the world, if you're making four hundred to six hundred a month, do you afford to prepare and pay insurance? How in the world do you afford to um, even do the exchanges? I mean, especially in a state such as this, who has decided not to do Medicaid expansion. Medicaid expansion is, is there not to create additional taxes or burdens or bureaucracy or any of that stuff. It's there to serve our elderly, our young, our poor, our needy. These are people who cannot help themselves. And it's important that we as citizens do what it is that we need to do as citizens and help support those folks. If we don't support those among us who can't help themselves, you know, what are we doing? I'd much rather have my money spent on helping people that need health care than on bonds.
making the trip to Charleston County. I appreciate your time and holding these hearings. Uh, the Supreme Court, in its decision, first of all, I want to say that Charleston County Republican Party passed a resolution back in February to support the South Carolina Freedom of Healthcare Protection Act, which starts with South Carolina and with freedom. Okay, and uh, many other counties throughout South Carolina have done the same. When the Supreme Court was reviewing the Affordable Care Act, they determined that the uh, fines imposed by the IRS under the uh, individual mandate clause were in fact taxes. Well, Article 1, Section 6 of our Constitution says that taxes will originate in the House of Representatives. But in the case of the Affordable Care Act, they did not. Those taxes originated in the Senate. And I understand there's another case going before the Supreme Court uh, filed by the Landmark Legal Foundation that will challenge that on constitutional grounds. The uh, professor that Mr. Jones was talking about who flew in from Richmond, Virginia by private plane because he doesn't like getting broke by the TSA and airports is Dr. On Walter E. Williams. On our nickel. Shh. Dr. Walter E. Williams is a respected professor at Virginia Commonwealth University. And he talked about the precedent of states overturning <coughs> unconstitutional federal law. And one of the examples he, he cited was the Fugitive Slave Act, in which many Midwestern states said, no, we will not take escaped slaves and return them to their masters in the slave states. We will let them live free in our states, because they knew that the Fugitive Slave Act was unconstitutional. They had morals. They had character. And there are many other uh, constitutional precedents. 2006, the Congress passed the Federal Real ID Act. 2007, South Carolina says, no, we will not hold our citizens to get a federal ID card. We'll issue our own ID cards. That's about freedom and liberty, my friend. More recently, you know, I show respect to you. You show respect to me, Scott. More recently, we had Colorado and Washington uh, basically reject the federal prohibition on marijuana usage. So that's another constitutional example. And I, I, I agree with Senator Rose about the free market health care reform ideas that he, present, he presented. Whenever we have competition, we get better pricing and a better product. East Germany citizens had to buy a two-stroke diesel car called the Trayband. And when they became free, when they are able to choose between other cars that actually delivered a good product at an affordable price. Nobody bought trade bands anymore. They went out of business. So if we introduce competition in medical care in South Carolina, just like we have with cell, cell phones, landscaping services, and even lawyers, the people will get a better product at a more affordable price. There's another free market reform I think we should do, and that is to shield retired doctors from the burden of carrying malpractice insurance if they practice in charity clinics. That will encourage more charity medical care where people get good care and service at a much more reasonable price with better outcomes as research shows. So let's put our heads together in the South Carolina Senate. Let's reject or let's approve the South Carolina Freedom of Health Care Protection Act and then come up with complementary free market legislation that will make South Carolina health care more accessible and more affordable to all. Thank you, gentlemen. Good evening, sir, and uh, thank you for hanging in there. I know the hour is getting late. Uh, my purpose for standing up here tonight is to uh, discourage you from voting uh, positively on 3101. Keep it in committee, don't bring it to the floor, but if it does get to the floor, it's, uh, please don't vote in favor of it. Uh, you've heard tonight that it's nullification. We've heard tonight that it's not nullification. Either way, it's a litigator's dream, and it will be our tax dollars down the drain as, as, uh, as we pay the expenses of taking it to court. Even our own Post and Courier has said that the Affordable Health Care Act is here. Modify it if you must but it's here, let's use it to our advantage. Already you've heard numerous examples about how it's been positive 
in, in a limited way in South Carolina. I'd like to suggest to you one other that may not have been mentioned, and that is that it mandates that 80% of the premium cost must go towards health care. And in fact, in South Carolina, residents have re received rebates on their premiums because in the past, the, uh, those funds have gone to administrative costs of the CEO's salary. <coughs> Uh, let me suggest to you that your attention is better spent on things that have previously been mentioned, like jobs, and not just the, the uh, jobs like Boeing, where we've given away the farm in order, to, in order to bring industry here. We need to focus on education, which has been underfunded to, for the last 10 years. And we need also, as, as you pointed out, and will be doing, uh, to focus on ethics reform. So, Please don't bring it, vote positively on this, on this bill if it comes to the floor. Uh, in summary, it's a bad law that will only benefit attorneys. Thank you. Judge Brown. suffer. But how do you get to the point where people are taken care of properly? Government did not create the colonoscopy. Government did not build the hospital systems. In fact, the Catholic Church has most of the hospital systems. And they now are on there under attack, their own tenants by Obamacare. Government didn't make America great. Government didn't build Manhattan or the Chicago skyline, or invent the car, or help Thomas Edison. Freedom did. Freedom. If money was the answer in America, we would not have any problems. Money is not the answer. Encroachment on our freedom, which in our activities is cumulative, is the free market. Every answer exists in the free market, but government meddles with the free market every chance they can to pander to some group and they divide us like we're divided tonight. Pick it. They'll divide you by race, my right brother. They'll divide us by gender, my right Mary. They'll divide us so that they can get their district to give them the votes to keep their fat cat salary and benefits going. What made America great is freedom. It is a shame that we have unemployment in this country because we don't have to. The reason we have unemployment in this country is because government encroachment. Our tax code is bizarre. Our tax code says it's better to send jobs overseas. We, if you want jobs, why do you tax jobs? How many taxes are on the payroll? How many, if you go to work, how many taxes are inherent with a job? If you want more jobs, you don't tax them. And the list goes on and on and on. What does the government, the federal government do well? Social Security? No. Medicaid? No. Medicare? No. Only yes. one thing I can think of. Yes. education? No. Yes. Medicaid's going broke too. And the baby boomers are coming like a herd. No, they're people, sir. They're not a herd. They're please, not animals. Please, they're a herd. Listen, 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 I'll call my fellow citizens on You have time to talk. Let him talk. General so General let's General take General. care of the people. Let's take care of the people. It comes with freedom. Now, we're about to see the federal government that does nothing well take over one sixth of our economy. It's not a government takeover. Yes. When you've got a 2,700 page bill, they call it law, backed up by now 20,000 pages of regulation, that's not a law. That's a new totalitarian system of government, and it will not work. Now, 
If you want to look at the history, you want to find out what made America great, it was the freedom and the opportunity to let free markets work. And free markets and the abandon of them is what caused the high cost of health care to begin with. When, 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 when the government was sitting there back in 40 years ago it started, where they were throwing money at health care and Medicaid and things, when inflation was 2%, they were throwing 18% at it. What do you think the doctors and hospitals and pharmacists did when they saw the government throwing 18% at the problem? They well, raised the price of on yachts. I'm telling you folks, it's freedom. And Obamacare, with 20,000 plus pages of regulation, does not solve the problem. But we could solve the problem if we quit the bickering, we quit the split politics, and quit pretending whether we're Republican or Democrat, there is right and there is wrong. And free markets is the answer to it. The Catholic Church, the biggest hospital system in the world, they don't take a dime from government. You want to call it charity? Call it what you want. It's religious tenets to get them there. I vote for freedom and not Obamacare. Now, we as a people 
must come together and work together. And, and not as Republicans or Democrats, or hell is forbid the Tea Party, we as self Galenians must come together, put a viable program on the table, and work with that. And then stop this nonsense going on. Thank you, and I appreciate you. <laughs> John Gentry, Gentry, did I pronounce that correctly? John yes, Gentry. Gentry. Yes, sir. Good evening, sir. Thank you for your time. Um, Mr. Davis, I'll direct my comments towards you since I guess you're the only Republican left. I want to start out by saying that I am a Republican also, and I do not support Obamacare. I respect the people who do. Um, but I don't, and I never have, and I never will. That being said, I do not support House Bill uh, 3101 either. Um, there's been a lot of talk about history tonight, and one thing that hasn't been mentioned is that the first governor of South Carolina, John Rutledge, uh, while they were forming the Constitution, he was at the Constitutional Convention, he stated that the federal court is the arbiter of disputes between the Congress and the states. And so it's not just Marbury v. Madison. It's even before the Constitution was formed, this idea that the federal court, the highest federal court of the land, the U.S. Supreme Court, is the final, has the final say in what laws are constitutional. <coughs> I also want to direct your attention to another case that hasn't been mentioned, and it's the last time that the nullification issue was directly addressed in the Supreme Court. And that case is Cooper v. Air, which uh, happened in the late 1950s. And that case held that the Louisiana state legislature could not impose laws similar to these in order to thwart integration efforts by the federal government. That's the last time the U.S. Supreme Court has ruled on nullification. So now I want to talk just for a moment about the pragmatic issues here. You say you care about fiscal responsibility. If this law passes as it is, there will be a federal lawsuit that will probably take place immediately. The state will have to hire a federal appellate um, lawyer from D.C. probably who will charge an arm and a leg. And it, in the end, it'll probably cost us about $8 million to fight a losing battle. But the, even the point underlying all of that is, since this law basically ignores the ruling of the U.S. Supreme Court that held the voluntary constitution, if this law passes, and it's deemed to also be unconstitutional, are we going to follow that? Where does this end? It seems like if we're willing to say, well, we're not going to listen to the Supreme Court on this one case because they're wrong. We think that it's unconstitutional. Why couldn't we just say, well, they're wrong in holding the law we're about to pass unconstitutional? If you go through that line of reasoning, it ends in anarchy. If we are the ultimate arbiter of what's constitutional or not, if any state gets to decide what laws they're going to follow and which ones they aren't, then anarchy will result. Um, so again, I'm a Republican, I'm a conservative, but I'm against this law. Uh, working our way through, guys, just a few more. Um, Michael Turner, Michelle Turner, excuse me. Yes, I don't think this works. Um, I'll actually be representing um, two sides today, um, or two people. First, I'd like to represent the League of Women Voters, and I hope you've heard from them at your other meetings. Um, in 1993, League of Women Voters of the U.S. adopted a position calling for a basic level of quality health care at an affordable cost being available to all U.S. residents. Um, in the late 80s, 
in the early 90s, in my college years, I had a button that said, help, help, my health insurance is killing me. And I cannot believe that here we are over 20 years later and we're still fighting the same battle. Um, over the past 20 years, the League has lobbied hard for passage of comprehensive health care reform and celebrated success when the Affordable Care Act passed, was signed into law by the President and upheld by the U.S. Supreme Court. To get to that point, the League did undertake a two-year study looking at the funding and delivery of health care in the U.S. Phase one studied the delivery and policy goals of U.S. health care system. Phase two focused on the health care financing and administration. They announced its initial health care position in 92, final in April 93, um, and it outlines the goals that the League believes are fundamental for U.S. health care policy. These include policies that promote basic level of care, affordable cost, um, and strong cost control mechanism to ensure the efficient and economical delivery of care. Um, services we believe that are of highest priority would be the prevention of disease, health promotion and education, primary care, including prenatal and reproductive health care, acute care, long-term care, and mental health care. Dental vision and hearing are also important and they should be essential for children. To achieve this more equitable distribution of services, we endorse increasing the availability of resources in medically underserved areas, training providers in needed fields of care, standardizing the services provided under publicly funded health care programs and insurance reforms. Our position includes support for strong mechanisms to contain these rising health care costs, and particular methods to promote the efficient and economical delivery of care would include regional planning for allocation of resources, reducing administrative costs, reforming the malpractice system, co-payments and deductions, and managed care. In accordance with our position for health care at an affordable cost, uh, co-payments and deductibles are acceptable cost containment mechanism, but only if based on an individual's ability to pay. We're making efforts to work with and not against the Affordable Care Act. The U.S. League has actually supported much more progressive um, national payer system, but we realize we're not there yet. Um, this is a step in the right direction. We need to bring health care coverage to all, and that includes here in our state, the expansion of Medicaid. We're fighting back against the attempts to undermine <coughs> this Affordable Care Act do not support H3101. Um, we remain vigilant in light of these efforts to repeal or diminish the law in Congress and in the courts. Um, now I'd like to uh, wear a different hat, and that is as a nurse, um, and actually a rehab nurse. Um, and Shelley brought up the, the young man that was bleeding, unable to afford a procedure that can help diagnose and probably could not afford treatment for his condition, which probably was just a simple surgery. Um, I want you to know that he might not be able to afford those procedures now, but the hospital will not and cannot turn him away when he is unstable, when he has to be admitted and taken care of, probably in the operating room, probably in the intensive care unit, and is at a much more depleted state, not only for his chances of survival, but in terms of the costs. If he has to be taken care of, he will be taken care of at exponentially higher costs than if treated early on and had adequate care. Who ultimately bears this cost is all of us. The system works because we all end up paying for it. And in our state, as pointed out by other um, industries that have come here or refused to come here, at a very high cost. Um, I'm sure some members of the Senate have experienced time in a hospital or, or family members time in a rehab. Um, it, that's often not a covered benefit. And yet, with our rehab services, after a stroke or spinal cord injury, we can get you to a point to become healthy and a productive member, once again, of the community, rather than somebody that additional resources would have to pay to be taken care of. I do encourage you to not pass the H101, 3101, and, and actually to work towards working towards a better compromise and making improvements to the current Affordable Care Act.
the issues of the constitutionality of such a bill as 3101 and the nullification, that whole set of arguments, I think it's been well discussed here and are critical. But the ability for people to be healthy and take care of themselves is at risk. One loss of a job, one loss of a disconnect with the uh, employer system that we have <coughs> could be devastating. Those are the things that the Affordable Care Act have brought for us the ability for people to get through difficult times or to continue. I'm not 65. Okay? Some years when I am, Medicare is there for me. I'm fortunate my pre existing conditions are probably not going to kill me in the next little while. The, the insurance that I used to have covered me, my wife, four children. And it cost me about $650 a month. I was a teacher at that time uh, in, uh, over West Ashland. And that was the cost of the state health care plan that I had. When I left there and went to a different position where they didn't offer health care, but I thought it was something I really wanted to do and believed in, I went there, I took the, um, the cohort. Uh, you may have heard about COBRA, I'm sure you have, and you probably have the same impression that everybody else has about COBRA. You get on COBRA, oh my goodness, those rates are ridiculous. Okay, all of a sudden I was paying $1,300 a month. When that ran out after 18 months and I tried to get insurance in the free market, <laughs> How did freedom work out? <laughs> but I was very fortunate. This was only in the past uh, half year, a little bit more than half year. I saw that come January 2014, I'll be able to get, get health care. Members of my family who had pre-existing conditions, the total sum, we ended up hugely increasing the amount that we had to pay for what would be covered, and many things would not be covered. The Affordable Care Act brought us the ability to keep our children, perhaps your children, up to age 26 under their parents' plan. The other thing that has not been touched on here that I think is really key, if it's a discussion about choice and freedom, I've heard a lot in the news lately, this is actually the other thing I was going to talk about, so please uh, allow me. about people having uh, care taken away or plans changed <coughs> or the inability to get other, to get the insurance plan that they wanted to continue. Those plans have been terminated because they did not provide people with sufficient care. <laughs> for the types of plans that would give, for example, $50 any time you had a significant, any particular situation occur. That's very affordable. I'll give you some great insurance. I'll give you a great premium. And I'll get 50 bucks if you have to go to the hospital. Thank, thank you, Doctor. I've got two more people on here, and, and I, I really want to give everybody a chance to speak, but I'll let you finish your comments. If you have okay. um, the, uh, Maybe the I'm sorry. I understand the point of view as well. Um, the, uh, the final thing, the kind of care that we have now where we have people go into the emergency rooms, et cetera, if they, if they are uninsured. And the whole suite of things that flows from that, but I won't try to remain So much of that is able to be controlled we have uh, health care that provides for, for preventive maintenance of our bodies like we do for our cars. Allowing ourselves to go and get physicals, allowing ourselves to go and take care of making sure that we're doing what we need to do. 
not have to go in and be taken care of when things get to such a dire extreme. That is a huge benefit. That will save us as citizens and as humans money. So thank you, Dr.
and then we have consumer choice, which is our co-op. The one thing that um, I would make you aware of, Senator Davis has more than one, but in Title 44, under the Medically Indigent Assistance Act, enacted in 1985, it says, it is the intent of the General Assembly to assure the care for the largest possible no number of medically indigent citizens within funds available by expanding the number of persons eligible for Medicaid services using additional state and county funds to take advantage of matching federal funds. Does that not conflict with South Carolina's position that they will not expand <coughs> Medicaid in our state? when it's been a law since 1985. The other thing, Senator, is that Beaufort County, Jasper County, and Hampton County have the lowest premiums in the state. You are on the, on the legislative committees of two of those, Beaufort and Jasper. What do you tell our people when they can't get those low premiums? People are coming to our office from Hampton County and Jasper County just to get on, um, to be able to use our computers when we can get on the healthcare um, site. And they don't come just one time. I've had people come every day. And we're, and you know, each day we finally have to give them applications. But they're just glad. One lady told me that if she gets the assistance that she needs, that maybe her and her husband can have more money to repair their house or buy groceries that they can't afford when they're eating more medicine, more fish, things that they have to from nature instead of going to a grocery store. She's excited because she may be able to now economically be better off. Also, in South Carolina, in the low country, the highest rate of prostate cancer is in our young men. They're happy now because they can prevent the services that doesn't, put, doesn't get them to a doctor or an emergency room when they're at stage three or stage four. They can be caught and they can stay with us a lot longer, making a, a better family. So I would ask you, Senator, because you are from our area, to take this into account. And I would ask all of you to please look at Title 44. And if our legislator, our General Assembly said, that they would expand Medicaid. They need to do it now. Thank, Thank you. you. Department. 
if Boeing sneezes, there's yes. going to be somebody there from the legislator to run and take up the ticket. It is very difficult to understand how every time something happens in this state, it is designed to benefit somebody other than the citizen. Yeah. 
Mr. Speaker, I mean, I'm going to say this. I oppose those subsidies. I oppose corporate welfare. I oppose what President Bush did. I don't believe in this administration. I never have, and I appreciate your right to speak, but I don't appreciate the insinuation that I'm a racist. No, no, I, I, no. I, I'm just laying it all out. You've got a legislator from Tennessee who gets $3.5 million of our money yearly, and he is beating the drum to cut food stands. See, there's a myth in this company, in this country, that the people who are in need are in need because they're lazy. That is the biggest lie going. There are a bunch of hardworking people in this job. There is economic inequity. There is unemployment. And a lot of people are in need because they have been shuffled down to the bottom of the economic pile and they can't get out. We've got jobs going overseas. We've got high rates of unemployment. We've got uh, how many how many uh, how many incentives was Boeing given to come into South Carolina? And I voted against the incentives, man. Oh well, okay. good. All right. Good. Let me just say this. Do you have any further things you want to say about H3101? I don't want to cut you off, but there are a couple more people well, yeah, there's speak. one. There's one That's more fair. thing. If it passes, you already know it's going to cost us a couple of million dollars um, uh, to fight. Yeah. Like we had to, the, all the, like the money we spent on, on, on uh, our, our photo ID for the elusive uh, 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 fraud, uh, voter fraud that, that it, was so, it was so important for us to address. So please just keep that in mind. How much money can we throw away? Thank you. We have one gentleman here, and then I'll get you next, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. My name is Scott Martin from uh, Eufor County. Here by the center. The uh, reason I came up here is uh, drove up here tonight was because everybody in this country, not just the people in South Carolina, can help it's part of the human condition. We have frail bodies. Okay, it's obviously an emotional issue that we have going on tonight. Okay? So I heard somebody uh, he left earlier, but I heard him talk about solutions. Okay, so the question that we have to do, and I look at things very carefully, what, what has been tried in the past, what has worked in the past, what has failed in the past, okay? The uh, woman that was just up here, very energetic, are you 25? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she, uh, uh, she talked about uh, the, uh, the issue of the economy here, and uh, what I want to point out is economic freedom is what allows people to be able to get a job create a job. I wrote a couple of notes down here because I, I didn't really come prepared to speak. But uh, you know, Bill, uh, Bill Gates created uh, Microsoft. Steve Jobs created the Apple and the iPhone. And he did it without one penny from the government. He told President Obama, get the hell out of my way. Okay? That's that is called economic freedom. All right? I was born in 1964. LBJ was president. He said, I'm going to end poverty. Okay? There's more now than there ever was. Okay, it's a failure. Why is it a failure? Okay, economics. Because that's why it's failure. We put complete strangers that are 850 miles away who are looking out for their own. Their politics is a job for those people. I don't know if you can tell from my accent, but I'm a uh, I'm, I'm a South Carolina's my adopted home state. I've been here about a decade. I grew up in San Francisco. Nancy Pelosi. Uh, my hometown of for a long time. And a very pleasant woman to talk to. However, she thinks that sh that government is the answer to everything. Okay? Government is not God. I heard somebody talk about the, uh, the mention the New Testament according to Matthew earlier tonight and talk about you're supposed to help your neighbor. When, when government forcibly comes and takes the people that do have jobs, that have ideas that create tens of thousands of new jobs, and takes it from them, 
and, and takes the control of it, keeps and makes themselves wealthy, and then gives pittances to people that are poor and have a hope that they, they voted for these people because they were given hope that I will make your life better. Okay? This started in 1964, uh, it, 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 as far as my lifetime starts. It goes back uh, thousands and thousands of years. The, let, me, let me get to the point because uh, there were a couple other gentlemen that pointed, about, pointed out things that, uh, that I was going to mention. I was jotting things down about freedom. Economic freedom is what the Constitution was meant to defend. Okay, When you take an oath to defend the Constitution, it's to limit the government and keep them out of your way so that you can make your own choices in your life. That's called dignity. When you can make your own choices, okay? Let's talk about health care. I'm a perfectly healthy 49-year-old man. I have an autistic son. It is not your job or your job to take care of him. It is mine, okay? I will find a way. <laughs> it is not his job to take your money and give it to my son, okay? That is the opposite of human dignity. It is the opposite of economic freedom, okay? Nullification is just a word, okay? Nullification is anything from a three-year-old saying, I ain't eating your broccoli, to South Carolina said, we ain't part of your union, okay? And everything in between. Anybody here, uh, let, let's, let's look at some recent events. Colorado, they had a, a, a vote yesterday and whether they were gonna tax marijuana. Why are they taxing marijuana? Marijuana is against the federal law. That's right. The Supreme Court said marijuana is an illegal substance. Anybody been to Denver lately, Boulder? <laughs> Not only is smoking allowed, but smoking anything you damn well want is allowed in every single restaurant in there. They didn't, the, the, the law they passed, and it was actually a voter referendum, and it didn't say we're nullifying the federal um, the federal drug laws, it said, we don't care what you think. We are a sovereign state. And our job is to, our job as the state government, when the states made this, this union, they knew that their job, that, that human nature is going to try to collect, the people are going to try to, certain people will try to collect power, as much power as they can for their own good. Okay? And they will, and they will tell people whatever they want to tell them. Okay, let me cut through a couple of paragraphs here. Sorry, I didn't plan on talking about the um, a couple of more examples. Where somebody mentioned real ID tonight. Okay, real ID has been the law of the land since the nineties. There, yes, it has. It is a, it is a city, it is an active city law. Attorney General of the United States could go and arrest anybody for not having a real a, an ID card. Immigration, I told you where I came from. It, um, the the uh, federal government, Congress passed a law, President signed it, said that if somebody is here in this country illegal, they don't have their papers. The uh, Department of Homeland Security is supposed to round them up and leave There's parts of San Francisco where nobody speaks English. Okay? Okay? Feds aren't going to round people up. That's nullification. They said, we don't, you're 3,000 miles away, Washington, D.C. We have our own local community. We will take care of our community in the way we see fit. Okay? Healthcare is a personal relationship between you and your doctor. Okay? In the 1930s, Roosevelt. FDR got the government involved. What, what happened was, he said, he, did a, he, he took away economic freedom. He said, we are going to freeze wages and freeze prices. Okay? And so companies were trying to compete to get good work. So what did they do? They said, well, we can't pay them more money, but how about if we pay your doctor? That's where it came. And then the, the government said, well, wait a minute, they're doing something that we don't have. So they went and inserted themselves. They became the middleman. The middleman are all becoming millionaires. Let me ask you this. Why, how can a law be so good when we have multi-billion dollar insurance companies going and lobbying to pass it? How can
can that be good for you if you're a poor person who doesn't have any money? Okay? How many people in Congress or in the White House have ever run a help a doctor's office? How many of them have ever run an insurance company? Okay? They can't even build a website, okay, with more money than God has. You know, I, I, I was in the, I, I worked for the government for 20 years. I, I was in the military. I was in the Air Force. And at the working level, you got good people working in the government. Once you get to upper management and political appointees and elected offices, they're looking out for numero uno. And the exceptions are extremely rare. Okay? This law, the PPACA, Oral Bottom Care, is about control. Okay? It's about controlling your relationship with your doctor. Okay? And you know what's going to, if a doctor, doctors are smart people, and they want their economic freedom, they spend more time, I've got family members, start my wife, or they spend, they have more, more employees doing paperwork for insurance and for the government than they do actually taking care of patients. And that's why they're only seeing patients for 15 minutes at a time. Because because they have to pay for all the people just to do the damn paperwork for the middleman, okay? Who's control? And all you want to do is talk to your doctor, and you got to go. You got to go see the man before you can go see your doctor, okay? And putting government in charge of this is gonna be a mistake, all right? I support this nullification law. Call it whatever you want. You cannot let this come here. It will destroy healthcare in South Carolina. <laughs> You're going to go from three to zero insurance companies, and you're going to go from how many tens of thousands of doctors to zero. Because nobody can live and make a living. These doctors have to make a living too. Call Don't whatever. you have government yes. run health care? Sorry? Don't you have government run health care being a retired military? I don't go anywhere near it, sir. You know. The doctors who <laughs> play work. You play work. Yes, good question. The okay. DOD doctors, unless they're on call at the emergency room, they're 8 to 4 with a one-hour lunch break, and at 4 o'clock, it does not matter how many people are lined up out of the office, they get to leave. That's, that's government health care. That's government health care. The VA, the VA, I don't go anywhere near the VA. I'm a disabled veteran. I go nowhere near the VA. Oh, thank you. you. Thank you. Yes. 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 Thank you. Not get an opportunity to, to speak. Yes, um, I'm sorry, sir. Did you, did you want to comment? I'm sorry. Go ahead, and then you, sir. You didn't, sir. Good evening. Thank you, Senator. I am um, Kennedy Washington, former state senator. Yes. And you know, I don't have a long speech tonight. I'm going to be very brief. When we were in the House of Representatives, we always used to say, thank God for the Senate. <laughs> and to see members of the Senate tonight spending all of their time and the state money going around the state to deal with this particular piece of legislation. I'm disappointed. I'm really disappointed. You know full well, and I do, that the legislation is unconstitutional. And I'm sure that you're not going to pass it. This piece of legislation, the gentleman just got through talking about destroying health care and insurance in South Carolina. We don't have any. Over 300,000 people in the state of South Carolina don't have insurance, health insurance. And he's going to talk about destroying what we don't have in South Carolina. And when I discovered that the Senate and the governor decided that you were not going to expand Medicaid in South Carolina, I really was hurt. 
I feel bad because we know that too many people in this state. Now, Senator Rose talked about some plans and some legislation that he dealt with the last few years. Many of those same plans that we talked about in the Senate for years, we didn't do anything about it. When all of these people in South Carolina do not have health insurance, we haven't done a thing. And now we do have affordable health care according to what the Congress have passed. The Supreme Court said this in order. And we still talk about fighting the judicial fight that has been already approved by the Supreme Court. South Carolina needs to stop doing that. It's time up on that. We need to begin to. You know, if we would really call the act what it, all, what it really is, the ACA, rather than run around talking about a bottle cap, you don't have the problem that we're having today. Dick took a poll a few weeks ago. They asked the same folks whether or not they approve of the Affordable Health Care Act. The majority of the people in this country said yes. Went back to the same folks and asked them did they approve of Obamacare, they said no. <laughs> And I can talk about that all night, but I'm going to say this to you, Senator, uh, from Buford. And I used to represent a part of Buford County. Chairs, the delegation on there for a number of years. This piece of legislation is dangerous. Yes. Yes. You start talking, Dr. Martin Luther King, 50 years ago, I stood in front of the monument when he talked about the Southern state and infant position and nullification, that that's something that we hope would always pass. And here in 2013, we got folks talking about nullification. Something is wrong with that. Something is terribly wrong with that. And we said, yeah, Dr. King, you were right. But we're turning around doing the same thing that he said that was terribly wrong. And the gentleman say, well, nullification just means that, that, that you're not going to obey what the federal government said. You know, I'm sick and tired of folks talking about the federal government is this and that we're not going to do what the federal government said. The federal government got all of us here. Everything we do every day is like what we do in the Senate and in the, the House of Representatives in Columbia. You can't get around government. How are you going to get around government? It's impossible. And we are going to give back to the government what South Carolina ought to be getting. South Carolina is one of the poorest states in the nation. One of the most unhealthiest state in the nation. And we are talking about we're going to let other states, Jan Brewer and folks down there in Arizona, Casing Ohio, folks in Kentucky, all of these folks are doing the exchange, and, and, and here we are in South Carolina, poor as Joe Turkey, talking about we don't need. <laughs> and we talk about freedom. Man, this ain't no freedom. If, if, it, if, it, if it hadn't been for the federal government, I wouldn't be able to stand here tonight. I would have been able to serve in the Senate. <laughs> Gentlemen, I urge you. We don't always talk about the crazies in the House who, who make the new stupid legislation and had to come to the Senate that we just put it in the committee and leave it there. That's what you need to do with this particular legislation. I'm not going to keep it late. I know you're tired, you're running all over the state, but God bless you. Thank you. you, you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Senators, thank you very much for, for your time. I know uh, these meetings, they get long and they get heated, and we appreciate that you guys are paying attention.
to what the citizenry has to say. Um, I've got a question for everybody, though. One of the reasons that I hear an awful lot of people saying that we need to have Affordable Care Act is because the evil insurance companies, because they're gouging people. I would like to ask you a question. Do you think that because somebody draws a paycheck from a government entity, that they are a better person than if somebody draws a check from a private company? Yeah. So what I would like to know is, once again, whether it's a state entity or a federal entity, is that a better person because they are serving the federal government or getting paid by a government check? No, yeah. I would question. submit, no. 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 I think that people are people. So now let me ask you a question. If you're in a private industry, what is your job to do? Your job is to go ahead and try to grow that business. You want to go ahead and expand your payroll. You want to have more sales. You, you want to do everything you can to grow that business. Can you help me figure out why government would be any different? How many programs do you know that somebody might have gone in very well intentioned with a specific job that that does not all of a sudden have mission creep and it starts expanding and say, well, you know what, we've done, we've done this, but now we need to do that, and then we need to do this, and we need to do the other thing. And what I would submit to you is that the character is the same. So if you think that right now your life is tough because of the Can insurance I answer that company, question? no, ma'am. No, ma'am. But I have experience. You know, that's fine. I'll you talk to you in a minute. I will experience. talk to you. I will, to you. I will, I will take you to a minute. Testify, and then so what we're going to go ahead and close the hearing after a chance to testify. Let's please let him ask the floor. What I would suggest to you is that it's the same thing that's going to happen it in the federal not. government because things expand. Take a look and see what programs are out there. There's going to be an, end up being mission creep. They're going to end up taking more and more of your money, your hard-earned money, to go ahead and fund this stuff because what they they think that they can handle this good, so they're going to keep expanding. I would also suggest to you that if we define slavery as working for somebody without being paid, and absolute freedom is getting to keep all the money that you earn. At what level does it go? What level does taxation go That's to where you're starting to work as a slave? The slave, and so tax is absolutely slavery. Now the question is, is that at what point do you end up drawing the line? And so I would suggest to you that you want to watch it with health care. I would also ask, real quickly, Please. how many how many people here that want this ACA? And also, I keep hearing about schools. There's still a finite amount of money for school, finite amount of money for health care, finite amount of money for green space, because we want to make South Carolina beautiful. At one point or another, you've got to look at the financial reality here. The train, it's going to stop at one point. We're going to run out of money. Even though the federal government is printing like crazy right now, eventually, the laws of economics are going to kick in, and hyperinflation is going to kick in, and all the stuff that we're ar arguing about right now, it's not going to be worth anything. So all I would say is take a look at expanding your, your belief in expanding the federal government or state government, and I really, if you think about it critically, you don't want it expanded. I'm going to go, I'm going to go ahead. I think um, everybody has had a chance to speak, I hope. I, I can tell you from my own personal experience that this has been an extremely elucidating, interesting, and informative public hearing. I listen, listen to what everybody had to say, um, just as I listened to what people had to say in Greenville and Columbia. And I have to tell you that there are some things I have learned I did not know. And I suspect as time goes on, between now and January when the session starts, there'll be additional things that I learned that I did not know. I thank every single one of you for coming out and taking the time on this evening to share your views. Um, I'll let Senator uh, Johnson and Senator McElveen speak after me. But for myself, I thank you for taking the time. It's been helpful to me. It has helped me understand this bill in a way I did not understand it before. And, uh, and I am very appreciative, so thank you very much for that. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I, I want to thank you and your staff for, for doing this, for putting this hearing on.
our Senate, uh, Senate staff is here tonight also working his late hours with him at the Columbia. Um, they worked hard the last couple of days. And Senator, I would to commend you for these last three hearings. You've done a yeoman's job in conducting these. Um, everyone has got to say their piece. Um, you've got everyone to talk and not cut anyone off in three days. And that's what it kind of means are about. Um, I've, I've been to some meetings where the chairman will cut people off. I think we've, we've heard everything. And I'll tell you all, you know, the gentlemen on this panel, I know you don't know much of us because we're not from around this area, but these gentlemen, uh, Republican and Democrat, it doesn't matter. I enjoy serving with these folks. And I'll tell you why. We don't always agree. And if we always agreed all the time, then the world would be a very interesting place. But we treat each other with respect and dignity and decorum. And the gentlemen on this panel are statesmen who listen. And to me, in, in my short life as a public servant, I think that, that listening is, is, a, is a great start to, to public service. It's 